Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. We love things being new and improved and bigger and better, but sometimes the new thing is actually worse than what we had before. In Jeremiah chapter 2, the people of God are finding this out as they exchange the glory of God for things that did not profit. Today we're turning to Jeremiah chapter 2. Now as we turn to Jeremiah chapter 2, you'll remember that yesterday the Lord told Jeremiah that his ministry would be both of destroying and overthrowing as well as building up and planting. And today as we go to chapter 2, it's going to be a lot of breaking down. And so chapter 2 is kind of a long chapter. We're not going to look at every verse, but we're going to start at the beginning because we see the Lord's loving heart and how he grieves for the people who have gone away from him. These opening verses show how the Lord is like a loving husband, remembering the wonderful honeymoon with his bride. And so he says in verse 2, I remember concerning you the devotion of your youth, the love of your betrothal, your following after me in the wilderness. Back then, Israel was just holy to the Lord. She was dedicated to him. She's the first of his harvest. And that's just, just this point that, that God has a plan for all of the nations of the world. Israel was just the first fruits. And so it says here, all who ate of it became guilty, as in all who harmed her suffered God's judgment because to harm Israel was to harm the work of God. And so things started off so well, but then they changed. Now, if you've been going through the Bible with us, then you'll remember back from the historical books how things started off so well with the Exodus, but pretty soon started getting kind of rocky. After the Exodus, that first generation was just complaining and grumbling against the Lord, just acting without faith. And so the Lord sets them aside and raises up a new generation that will obey him. They do, and they go in, and you have the conquest of the land. But then things start going downhill, and they continue going downhill right into the book of Judges. Things go really bad there. By the time you get to 1 Samuel, the people are demanding a king. The Lord gives him Saul. He doesn't work out so well. The Lord gives him David. He is better. Then comes Solomon. Not so good. And after Solomon, the kingdom splits. And once it divides, it's pretty much just a downhill course from there. And so the Lord sees all of this, and he's asking the people, why? And so if you look at verse 5, he says, what injustice did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and walked after emptiness and became empty? In other words, people, I have watched over you and protected you from your earliest days. I never failed you. I provided for you. I gave you what you needed so you not only survive but thrive. Why have you forsaken me? We see what that forsaking looks like in verse 8. If you look at verse 8, it reads, The priest did not say, Where is the Lord? And those who handle law did not know me. This is critical. These people, these leaders did not know God. And it's not uncommon for the Lord's work among his people to seem like it comes to a halt. And at that point, people are supposed to look around and say, um, where is God? And we're just not seeing his blessings upon us. We're not seeing him working among us anymore. Where is he? And we're supposed to recognize that in those times, if God has pulled back his hand of blessings, it's because we're doing something wrong. We're following something that he doesn't want us to be a part of. We need to just go back and look at our life and reevaluate what we're doing and return back to the fundamentals. These leaders here, they're not doing that. They're kind of saying, well, okay, this whole God thing didn't really work out, so let's try something else. And so that's obviously just a, a total lack of faith. It's a lack of faith that God will work. It's a lack of faith that when we follow him, it actually changes how things go. And when they just are like, well, you know what? It doesn't feel like it's working. Remember, let's try something else. They're really saying, we don't believe what the word of God says and what God's promises are. And so these people here, they have strayed so far from the Lord. In verses 9 and 10, the Lord becomes their adversary. He's basically taking the court and he's laying out their sins. And so he says in verse 10, go as far as Kittim, which is an island in the Mediterranean Sea off of Cyprus, or go as far as Kedar, which is another name for Arabia to the east. The Lord is saying, look all around. Guys, no nation, no one does what you have done. Same idea in verse 11. Has a nation changed gods when they were not God? No, but my people have changed their glory for that which did not profit. And so in verse 12, the Lord summons the heavens to be appalled at this. We've mentioned in the past, whenever the Lord summons the heavens against us as a witness, that's trouble. We should sit up and listen and take notes of what the Lord is saying. And so he spells out their sins in verse 13. He says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, what's a cistern? A cistern is basically a well on the ground that was used to collect water. Now, they would a lot of times add rock and plaster to them so they, that water wouldn't escape, but sometimes it would get cracks and it would. But even then, it was never really fresh water. It wasn't really even healthy water. It might get slimy and algae, things like that. 
And the Lord is saying, guys, I am a fountain of living water. I, I am a spring of cool, clear, refreshing water for your soul. And you've forsaken me for a slimy, algae-filled cistern? What are you guys doing? His point is they've got all of this idolatry going on in their nation, all this other kind of religious stuff that they've added, trying to make things more exciting and more fun, and it's worthless. It's detrimental to their health. All of that tradition, all of those, all of those mystical things, all of that stuff they were doing, it was harming them. And this pretty much describes what people still do today. Um, rather than waiting on the Lord, rather than obeying him, rather than staying with the pure, clear, simple word of God, they make up their own thing. They add rituals. They add traditions. They even put a lot of work in all that stuff. But that stuff is unhealthy and unnourishing. It's not that soul-reviving truth of God. And therefore, they should go away from those things and come back to the Lord and just walk with him. And so going on in verse 17, the Lord tells them they have done this to themselves. They have forsaken their Lord. And then in verse 18, he warns them about going after other places for help. He says in verse 18, but now what are you doing going down the road to Egypt to drink waters of the Nile? Or what are you doing on the road of Assyria to drink waters of Euphrates? He's basically rebuking Judah for looking to help from Egypt or Assyria. And remember, in this region, during this time especially, there are these three nations that are vying for power. You have Assyria that's been in power for 300 years, but they're on the decline. You have Babylon's, that new rising force, and they're looking for an opportunity to take over. Then you have Egypt that's sometimes an ally of Assyria and sometimes joining her offense. Now, eventually, Babylon's going to come rise and take control of the region after the Battle of Carchemish in 606 BC. But at this point, Babylon's not taking things over yet, but it's not going to be long before they do. And the, and the Lord's warning them, guys, don't go to Egypt for help and don't go to Assyria for help because they're under my judgment too. And the Lord tells them in verse 19, your own wickedness will correct you and your apostasies will reprove you. Know therefore and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God and the dread of me is not in you, declares the Lord of hosts. And so the key here is they forsook the Lord and they did not have a dread of him or they didn't have a fear of him. Now that's similar to what we read a couple of days ago in Isaiah 66 verse 2, where the Lord is talking. He's like, I, I own the heavens. Where do I dwell? And he says, I dwell in the heart of the humble and contrite in spirit and those who tremble at my word. And that heart is the place where God dwells. But these people here, that's not how they were characterized. They were hardened to the Lord. Therefore, he didn't dwell among them and he was certainly distant from them. Along these lines, in verse 20, the Lord says, Long ago, I broke your yoke and tore off your bonds. And that was just that wonderful deliverance from Egypt and the Exodus. But look how they respond in verse 20. The people say, I'll never serve. I mean, just that, that sense of, yeah, you delivered me. I'm not going to serve you. Instead, they're like harlots in the next few verses. And then down in verse 21, it's obvious that they still have some aspect of the Lord still part of their world because they've got the temple there and all that stuff. And so he condemns them for trying to wash off their sins with much soap. He says, but the stain of their iniquity is before the Lord. And this is this idea here that these folks are going and doing all this idolatrous stuff, but the Lord has all these ceremonial washings. And so they come to the ceremonial washing and it's like, oh, you know what? Let's scrub extra good today, guys. You know, and this, this, this idea, they can just scrub off all of their sins. And the Lord's like, no, no, I'm looking for a heart change. You do that idolatrous stuff there, and then you come back and worship me? No, no. You, I'm looking for a heart change. I'm looking for repentance. Um, but they're not going to do that. They're just continuing on their way. And just when we think about our own life, it's kind of common in our own life too, to get caught up in the thinking of our day, that we can kind of dabble in all this other stuff, maybe things of this world or something we find online. And we might be dabbling with the very things that are opposed to God and really maybe not be even aware of it. And we're basically committing modern day idolatry. And so we ourselves need to be very aware of how we live and how easy it is for us to be blinded. And we should always be looking at what we're doing through the lens of scripture and confessing and repenting anything that's not of the Lord. Well, they don't do this, and they're going to find on out that they have exchanged the glory of the Lord for that which does not profit. And so when they get into trouble in verse 27, they're going to cry to the Lord, rise and save us. And the Lord's going to respond in verse 28. Let the false gods you put your trust in save you. Uh, you, you. You thought they can do it. Let's see if they can do it. And so throughout this chapter, we're seeing God is just letting them know of his judgment, but they will not listen. And so he says in verse 30, in vain I've struck your sons. They have accepted no chastening. Your sword has devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. And here we see there are times when someone is teaching the straight word of God faithfully, clearly, accurately, and people can so hate that message, they seek to silence him. Now, back then, they would just kill the prophets. Today, they find another church or they turn off the radio. We shouldn't do that. When someone's teaching the word of God clearly and accurately and faithfully, we should listen to that and embrace that because that's that refreshing waters of the Lord for our soul. 
to these folks here in verse 31, no, they don't do that. They relish in their freedom. They relish they can go wherever they want. And we'll just go find someplace else. Even in verse 33, they put more effort into seeking love than seeking God. In verse 34, they are just so deluded by their own sins. They have innocent blood on their garments. They don't even notice. In verse 35, they naively say that God's hand of judgment is not on them because they've done nothing wrong. How many times do you hear people say, I've done nothing wrong? Their hearts are too hard to see the evil they have committed. So then this chapter ends with just this warning that there is coming a day where they will march out with their hands on their head for the Lord has rejected those they are trusting in. We just hear this early warning of the coming deportation. You've rejected me, you've broken the covenant, and you'll be exiled from the land. Well, so that's chapter two. Not the happiest chapter around, but it is showing us in Jeremiah's ministry of breaking down the false thinking of his day. And even in our own day, we need to hear this message too because there is so much false thinking in our world here. And so Jeremiah starts on out explaining God's overflowing love for his people, but he ends with God's pronouncement of judgment upon them. Although they were the covenant people of God, they were about to enter into his judgment for their sins of rebellion against him. And so the heart of this message is that we can all walk after emptiness and become empty ourselves. God is a fountain of living, soul-refreshing, grace-giving water. And yet we can be bored by this simple, basic fellowship of the Lord. We want something more exciting. We want more. And we go after the allurements of this world that promise to be so satisfying, but are going to leave us empty. And so as God's people, we should always be taking a good, hard look at our lives and asking, what am I pursuing in life? Is this of the Lord? Am I doing this for the Lord? Am I bringing the Lord in this while I'm doing this? If not, we can guarantee it's going to leave us empty. Now, it's okay. You know, it's okay to do other things in your life like skiing or crocheting or whatever. But if that's your life and if that's what you're living for, if, if, if you're not bringing the Lord into it, if it's not of the Lord and for the Lord, it's going to leave you empty. We just need to watch out for those things and bring all those things before the Lord. Likewise, this chapter shows us how easy it is for us to justify sin and justify our disobedience. We can almost think, well, if I can just tell myself enough times I've done nothing wrong, I've done nothing wrong. But that's not the case. We sin before God, we enter into guilt before him, and we can deny it all day long, but that doesn't change that reality. We need those sins washed away by the blood of Christ, and that's how we are restored to fellowship with the Lord. Now, along those lines here, we see this principle that when our walk with the Lord is struggling, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, The Lord is supposed to be a part of our life, working in our life, working in us and through us, and if we're not seeing him working in our life, something's wrong. And so the Lord might just be trying to get our attention, showing us we're doing things he's not a part of. We're doing things that he doesn't want us to be doing. And when we come to that place and say, you know what? I don't see God working my life. We should just prayerfully go to the word and look at what it has to say, compare our lives to it and repent of anything we see where our lives don't conform to the things we see in scripture. And so as we finish, let's just bring all this before the Lord in prayer. Let's ask to guide us to a place where we're listening to him and, and just listening to sound teaching and, and going to his word and letting the truth of his word refresh us and letting his grace cleanse us of the things that might be otherwise keeping us from him so that we can drink alone from his cool, refreshing fountains of grace. Well, that's Jeremiah chapter two. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless. God bless.